Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. He's been on this journey to the cross. Jesus' Passion Week is now coming to a head prior to Jesus going to the cross. Last week we looked at the celebration of the Passover, the Lord's Supper. Jesus instituted what we uh, practice and celebrate as communion. And then we also see that Jesus gave a prediction concerning Peter's denial. We talked a little bit about Peter's words to Jesus in it that Peter said that he would never deny or forsake or, or betray Jesus. And all the disciples said the very same except one named Judas Iscariot. Now I said last week, and I'll say it again, I truly do believe that this was a true statement from Peter's heart. That Peter had no intention or desire to deny Jesus. But we also see that man doesn't know his heart as well as he thinks he does. Jesus knows the true motives and thoughts of our heart. And what Jesus spoke is what he knew about Peter's heart. What Peter spoke was what he didn't know about his heart, but it was from a truthful and sincere place. Jesus then begins to say to the disciples in so many words, he tells Peter, well, you're going to deny me and the rest will forsake me is what he says. He says in verse 31, all of you will be made to stumble because of me. Then Jesus gathers the disciples, the 11. Judas, at this point, is already with the religious leaders in trying to prepare this way in which they are going to arrest Jesus. Judas very well knows that Jesus would be at a specific place in the garden. And so Judas knows where Jesus will be. The religious leaders don't. Judas, at this point, is being the guide for those sinners that Jesus said would come and arrest him. When you look at this here, Jesus gathers the 11 disciples, puts eight of them aside, and tells three to come with him, commonly known as these three disciples, Peter, James, and John. And Peter, James, and John have this special privilege of being with Jesus in a time in which, in his humanity, he's very vulnerable. And there's nothing wrong with looking at it this way. I mean, you consider a couple of things about Jesus' humanity, and I think when you do a proper reading of Philippians chapter 2, you begin to see how Jesus' life was lived here on this earth. Jesus, in his humanity, prayed a very... Uh, powerful prayer, but with such emotion and agony in it. Luke's gospel gives us some details that the other gospel writers don't get us in regards to Jesus' physical experience during this time of praying. I believe that a lot of what Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane dealt with the very cup that Jesus prayed three specific times for that if it could pass him by. Now we know this, that Jesus then finds Peter, James, and John asleep. Now let's look at verse 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus voluntarily surrenders he voluntarily surrenders his will, like Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, that he was obedient to the point of death, the death of the cross. But we also see here that in verse 38, Jesus said that his soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Even to death. And so consider this for a moment. There are four things that we can look at in Jesus' prayer. Four things that are in Jesus' prayer, and I want you to draw your attention to this. If you're taking notes, jot these down. The first thing that we see is Jesus' address. You can tell a lot about somebody when you see them in times of agony and despair, when they're going through trials, when they're facing difficulties in life, and you can really tell a lot about a person's character and the type of Christian they really are when they're going 
through a very great trial. If you are close to this person, you can tell by who they address, who they go to, who they seek out, what they do in order to help in this time of difficulty. Jesus' this season here is a time in which Jesus is crying out to the Father. His address is to the Father. So Jesus' circumstance and situation that is known to Peter, James, and John, those that have walked closest to Jesus, his address here is to the Father. That's an amazing thing because Jesus addresses the Father. Mark's gospel uses another word for Father. He uses the word Abba. Jesus appeals or addresses to the Father, in other words, because in great, intense agony, he gives an assured address. There's an assurance in his address. In other words, it's kind of like a child that is, that is perhaps worried or fearful, but the moment they see their mother or their father, you could see the relief for a moment. This is kind of the idea and the expression. He gives an assured, take note of that, an assured address. It's not just any address, but the address is assured because of who he's crying out to. He is crying out to the Father. The second thing we see that Jesus says in his prayer in verse 39, he says, if it is possible, if you are willing, the other gospels say, Jesus says, if it is possible, all that is the Father's will is possible. Jesus is not asking the Father something that is impossible for him to do. No, all of the Father's will is possible in the realm of his will and purpose. We get an idea here in which Jesus is just asking. He's saying, listen, if there can be an other way without drinking of this cup that is clearly pictured of the wrath that Jesus is about to experience as he goes to the cross. The wrath of God that deals with sin. When you read through the book of Revelation, and you get to chapter 16, it's interesting that you find that this is the finality of God's wrath being poured out, is what Revelation would reveal to us. Now, at the end of chapter 15, the Bible says there that no one can enter into the temple in heaven. We know that prior to that, the Antichrist has access to the temple on the earth, but no one can enter the temple in heaven. Now, this is interesting because when it gives this statement, remember, you enter the temple for the purpose of what? Offering up your prayer and sacrifices to the Lord on behalf of those outside the temple. The point that's being made is that when you get to the book of Revelation and you're down to the bold judgments, you've already went through the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. When you get to the bold judgments, this is the finality. Seven angels, seven last plagues. The number seven is the number of completion in the Bible. This is God's complete wrath. It's the finality of it. And the verse says at the end of chapter 15 that the temple in heaven that no one can enter in. Meaning what? that nobody can stop the finality of God's wrath on the sons of disobedience. There's no more intercession. It's irrevocable. That's a pretty interesting place to be. That day will come. And when we consider God's wrath, we think of God's wrath coming upon the sons of disobedience. Yes, that is true. That's what the scriptures say. The Bible says, as Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, he says that God has not appointed us under wrath. What I think is interesting about this is because if God has not appointed us under wrath, it would imply that the wrath that we were to get has already been dispensed somewhere and someone and something has bore the wrath that you and I are deserving of because of our sin. So we looked at this last week in regards to the cup and this experience with this that would cause great redemption and praise, the halal, is really what the cup that's in view here with the meal in verses 26 through 30. But it would be wrath that would be poured out, not because of Jesus' sin, but our sin. So the wrath that you and I deserved 
was poured upon Jesus on the cross will never experience it. Jesus prays this prayer and what he's saying is if there's be any other way that I can bypass this wrath. Jesus was not saying he doesn't want to go to the cross. And Jesus is not saying, you know, Lord, I know this might be impossible for you, Father. No, Jesus is clearly saying in the realm of his will and purpose, if there just be another way. Jesus was not opting out, but in his human nature, I mean, really think about it. Can you in your humanity, this just goes to show the humanity of Christ. Remember what I said, he's not, he wasn't 50% man and 50% God. He was 100% both. But it reveals Jesus's humanity. And I think oftentimes, yes, Jesus is God. He's declared it himself. He'll say, he'll reveal it in this, in this time in his life that he is God. But it's this amazing dynamic that we see in Philippians 2 that declares to us how this worked in Jesus' life. In Philippians 2 and verse 5, Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And what is that mind? Some would say, well, I don't have this mind. How can the mind of Christ be in me? Paul, writing to the Corinthians, says, you have the mind of Christ. And with this, we see here that Jesus is saying, listen, I'm not trying to get out of this, but if it's possible within the realm of your will and purpose. Now, I want to draw your attention to the third thing that is said in this prayer, and it is, if it is possible, here's the third thing, let this cup pass me by. This is a petition to remove the cup. It's just a petition. It, it falls under if it's within the realm of your will and purpose. Well, we know that it's not, and Jesus is not resisting the will of the Father, and he's not fighting the will of the Father in his humanity. He's praying a very sincere, and this is what lends more to the agony that we read in Luke's gospel that kind of gives us a description of what Jesus was going through as he was praying. Now, you can try to chop this verse up any way you want. You can try to render it and say, this is the way I would. Let me tell you something. You've never prayed this way. You've never been in this situation. So let me tell you something. It's better for you just to sit back and hear what the Lord is really trying to tell you. You and I have never, like what I believe, Paul is the writer of the book of Hebrews. What he told the Hebrew believers, he says, you've never been brought to bloodshed. What are you worried about? You're trying to go back to the ways of Judaism and persecution. As the, you just heard about persecution and you're already running. And I'll tell you here, the agony, the agony is with greater intensity in the humanity of Christ and this is what we find in this. All that Jesus could have used in Philippians 2. Listen to this. It says he emptied himself of. Do you understand that? All that he could have used in this time, in this prayer, in this agony. All that he could have used, he emptied himself of it. That's what Philippians 2 says. Fully man, fully God. But I love what Jesus says here. Listen, guys, in his humanity, he's saying he's addressing the father. He's saying, if it is possible or if you are willing. And he's saying, let this cup pass me by. Here's the fourth thing. I love this. He says, nevertheless, not my will. But yours be done. You know what he's saying? This kind of cleans up the whole prayer. Are you ready for this? It's funny. I've been asked this question. Why did Jesus pray this? Well, have you listened to what Jesus said? He said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be. You know what he's saying? He's saying, your will is primary. My will is secondary. I think that answers the prayer very clearly. As Jesus prays this prayer, 
Some of the Gospels say that he was a stone's throw away. This would imply that the disciples were able to hear what Jesus was praying, perhaps prior to falling asleep. Jesus comes and he finds the disciples sleeping in, and he says to Peter, he says, what could you not watch with me one hour? In Jesus' greatest need, Peter is asleep. In these verses, in verses 40 and through 44, 45, we see the value and desire that Jesus is placing on the help that he would like from the disciples in prayer from his friends in this battle. We see the very value that Jesus is placing, the desire. Jesus is looking to the disciples for help. It's pretty interesting. Jesus looks to us for help. Jesus is looking to the disciples for help. There's the value of his desire. Jesus is saying, can you not tarry with me one hour? These are his friends. These are his disciples. These... And Jesus is in a time in which he's about to be arrested. Jesus, knowing that the scriptures will be fulfilled, we see a battle here. And the best way to battle is in prayer. And Jesus is explaining this. I think Jesus gives the warning. He says, the spirit indeed wills, but the flesh is weak. And, and we know the flesh, human weakness, the flesh is without any. The spirit wills to do the will of the Father. It wills to pray. It wills to intercede. It's the flesh that is weak. The flesh gives in. The flesh wants to opt out. The flesh wants to sleep when we should be praying. The flesh wants to do other things when we should be reading. The flesh wants to do and pay attention and give full attention to things other than the things that draw us closer to Christ. The Spirit indeed wills, but the flesh is weak. And so what we see here with this picture and this prayer is we see Jesus' heart not only to the will of the Father, but Jesus' heart toward the disciples. So a second time he went away and prayed. and He said, oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away, notice this. If this cup cannot pass away from me, he says, unless I drink it, your will be done. In other words, he had to drink it in order for it to pass by. There was no way around it. I had to partake of it. I couldn't opt out, but I have to drink it. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Notice that every time Jesus would pray the same prayer to the Father, about the will of the Father, about the cup that he was about to drink. And then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus has already prayed this two times, the same prayer. And in verse 44, the Bible says, so he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time. Same prayer the third time, saying the same words. There's nothing wrong with praying the same prayer, okay? Now, you could pray for somebody more than once. It's okay. Yeah. And, and some would teach you that, well, if you pray for a, a person or something more than once, then you don't have enough faith. No, you're just praying again. I mean, within the Jewish culture, the mentioning of a person's name twice gave great attention. Like when Jesus said, Peter, Peter, Martha, Martha. I think in a time of prayer, Jesus is, is repeating the same prayer because it's of great importance, but it has to do with the will of the Father. So Jesus prays a third time. And he's saying these words as he prayed three times concerning, notice this, the cup. 
Then he came to his disciples and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. The time is at hand. The time is drawing near. And the disciples, listen, Peter, James, and John, well, they're like half asleep. Well, what are you talking about? Jesus had already predicted his death on more than one occasion, in the manner in which he would be taken to the cross and that he would die. And all these things Jesus had already spoken, and yet we see here that all these guys can do is sleep. Now, when we look at this, we would say, wow, you know, I would hate to have those kind of friends around me. I don't see that much difference from the church today. Jesus is declaring that his second coming there's urgency. But the church is asleep. We often hear in the writings of the apostles a reference for us to wake up out of our sleep. Romans 13, 11. For now is a high time. And I think that that is a word that transcends every generation in the body of Christ, because the second coming of Jesus is what we would call the eminent return. It can happen at any moment. So it's not to debate how is it that Paul, in writing to the Romans, thought that Jesus was coming in his day, and he did, and here we are 2,000 years later, and Christ has not yet come. Did Paul get it wrong? Did Jesus lie? What's going on? Did they misinterpret? No, at the end of the day, here's what happens. Jesus clearly taught that he would come again, and they believed that Jesus could have came in their day. So they lived as if he did. We are to live the same way. But the disciples here heard Jesus on more than one occasion talk about the very moment that they are now at. And Jesus is saying, listen, the time is now. So in verse 45 here, we see Jesus submits to the betrayer. The time is now for him to be betrayed. Jesus is in complete control. Judas is not. Jesus is in control. As a matter of fact... Jesus had even told Judas to go and take care of what he needed to go take care of. Jesus has been in control the entire time. He's been in control in the prayer of the Garden of Gethsemane. And we know that this place means pressed oil. We know that the prayer, it has this intensity, even of what the name of the garden that it carries, this intense prayer. And... Jesus is in control of all of this. And so Jesus says, the hour is at hand. So Jesus submits. Remember what Jesus says, no one takes my life. Jesus says, I lay it down. Jesus lays his life down. He's been in complete control since the moment of Luke's gospel, chapter 9. In verse 51, it says that he set his face toward Jerusalem. He's been in control since then. And consider this for a moment. Jesus has been doing the will of the Father to fulfill it. And even here, Jesus says they're coming now to take me. So look at verse 46. Arise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus is in complete control. Listen to this. To meet Judas. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. Jesus is in complete control to meet Judas. How? Because of his address to the Father. In the way, in the manner in which Jesus prayed. The Bible says, according to Luke's gospel, jot it down, verse 22 and verse 43. The Bible says that at this time, Luke's gospel is the only one that records is that at this time... An angel came and ministered to Jesus. And remember that at the start of Jesus' ministry, his mother Mary was there. At the close of his ministry, Mary, the sister to Martha, was there. 
At the start of Jesus' ministry, after he preached the Sermon on the Mount, he healed a leper. At the end of his ministry, after he taught the Olivet Discourse, he's in the house of Simon the leper. At the start of Jesus' ministry, when he was tempted by Satan in, in, in the wilderness, angels came and ministered to him. And here now at the close of his ministry, after he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, an angel comes to minister to him. Ministering angels, the Bible speaks about in Hebrews chapter 1. And so we see here that the angel came to minister to Jesus. The Bible also says that in this time of intense prayer in Luke chapter 22 and verse 44, that Jesus, his sweat on his brow, sweated great drops of blood. Hematidrosis is the process that they call it where the capillaries open up and it's happened with people where they sweat because of great agony and stress. And it's possible for these capillaries to burst and the little bit of blood that comes will come forth with the sweat. Not that it was just like he was bleeding from his forehead, but you can see this type of agony within his prayer. This is just Jesus praying. And I think this is interesting because we can see the agony in his prayer. In verse 38, of chapter 26, we see that it says here, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, listen to this, even unto death. Now we see the picture. And so, Jesus goes from this very intense time of prayer and, and rebuke to his disciples, Peter, James, and John, but yet this Intense prayer where we see this battle. If, if there be any other way. But then we see this confidence that, that the time is here. The hour is at hand that the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of sinners. So you see the real battle. But Jesus tells Peter and the disciples that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What is Jesus showing in this time of intense prayer? Even though we see the reality of his prayer, Jesus is saying, I will not give in to the flesh. And so you're not to give in to the flesh. There's only one way to handle this. Verse 46, rise, let us be going. See my betrayer is at hand. What does this mean? Pray, but also face the will of the Father head on. Be obedient to the point of death, the death of the cross. I like the picture here because we see the humanity of Jesus, but we also see the boldness of Jesus. Jesus was aware that the officials of the priests, some of the Roman guards, and Judas were on their way to arrest Jesus. The Bible says in verse 47, and while he was still speaking, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, notice that all the Gospels recognize Judas, and so does Jesus, in verse 50, as a disciple. They recognized him as one of the twelve. They viewed him as a disciple. In Acts chapter 1, in verses 15 through 20, we see that they replaced his position as a disciple, as a future apostle. So Jesus never treated Judas any different than any of the other disciples. They recognized him as one of their own. Did Judas ever recognize himself as one of them? 
Let me draw your attention a little bit to how Judas spoke to Jesus. Well, we see back in chapter 26, when Jesus said to the disciples in verse 21, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Notice the dialogue between the disciples and Jesus. The Bible says in verse 22, they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? The disciples called Jesus Lord. Verse 25 says, Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is, is it I? Judas never called Jesus Lord. He called him Rabbi. The question that we have tonight, we know the story. We know that Judas Iscariot betrays Jesus. And, 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 and some people take this statement that's made in verse 24. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Some people take this statement and say that Judas Iscariot was created by God for the purpose of destruction to send him to hell for what he did. God doesn't send nobody to hell. Hell was not created for Judas Iscariot. It was created for Satan and demons. So what does this mean? It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. had nothing to do with what Judas Iscariot was going to do at the point in which he betrayed Jesus, because the disciples were going to betray Jesus. Jesus said they would. He says it in verse 31. It's believed that what Jesus was referring to is the manner in which Judas Iscariot would die. He would commit suicide. It's a reference to what would take place as a result of him betraying Christ. So Judas never called Jesus Lord. Lord, the word here for Lord is master. Jesus was never Judas's master. Jesus was just Judas's rabbi. Now let me tell you, there's nothing wrong with being a rabbi. But let me give you the idea behind this thought. The idea is that as far as Judas was concerned, as it pertained to Jesus, it was always just business. It. And remember, guys, that sometimes this is how we treat our relationship with the Lord. It's just business. It's just business. Jesus made it very clear that in order to follow him, he, he laid out some very profound biblical truths. In Luke chapter 9, in Luke chapter 9, in verse 23, Jesus said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Listen to this. For whoever desires, notice the first point that Jesus makes is what? Check your desire. If anyone desires, not everyone desires to follow after Jesus. Not everyone desires to come after him. We desire other things. There are some people that are so in love with the idea of God, but not in love with the commitment to God. There are so many people that are in love with the idea because they've been told, hey, if you just come forward and give your life to Jesus, all your problems will go away. Lie. They won't go away. They're going to be there. But now you're not walking through them alone. Jesus is with you. That should bring more comfort to you than anything else. But people fall in love with this, with this picture of Jesus, that if you come to the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. We oftentimes misquote this psalm. What is it that we're to do with what it means to have these desires to follow after him? We are to 
yes, put our trust in the Lord and we are to wait upon the Lord. We are to follow after the Lord. But how can our desires be motivated by the Lord? You know that within every single one of us, there's not a soul in this sanctuary tonight that does not have desires. Every single one of you have a desire tonight. And I can assure you that every single one of you have a desire tonight in you that is not of the Lord. It's your desire, not his. I can guarantee you that. Because our human nature daily is producing desires to our liking, our being comfortable, our being happy. So then why does the Bible say that God will give you the desires of your heart? The Bible does not say that. Somebody lied to you, and I don't know what Bible you're reading. The Bible doesn't say that God will give you the desires of your heart. It's not what the scriptures teach. It's not what the Bible says. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, desire is a very powerful thing. What was Judas Iscariot's desire? Well, if he didn't call Jesus Lord, but he called him rabbi, it clearly shows us that his desires were not motivated by the one who puts the desires in our heart. The Bible says very clearly, Psalm 37. The Bible says in verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. That's step number one. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Step number two, delight yourself also in the Lord. And he shall give you the desires of your heart. And step number three, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. You see now? So when someone says, God will give you the desires of your heart, tell them you're a liar. I do. I've had people come to me and try to encourage me as because I'm a pastor, you know, and they'd say, oh, you know, pastor, God will give you the desires of. No, you're lying. What, what do you mean? He says, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that I need to trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord, delight myself in the Lord, commit my ways to the Lord. Now, list, just, let me just read this to you one more time, okay? Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. You ready for this? Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. You're like, there it is. You're You're wrong. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. Are you delighting yourself in the Lord? If you're not trusting in the Lord, you're not delighting yourself in the Lord. And the verse still doesn't say that he's going to give you the desires of your heart. Yes, it does. It says it right there. No, it doesn't. You're not reading it right. Because that's not the end of the verse. You're not even quoting the verse. It's the next step, the third steps, the third step that brings it to pass. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. The desire comes to pass by the Lord when you trust in him, delight in him and commit your ways to him. What are your desires tonight? Some of us have sexual desires that are impure. Probably thinking about those right now. I'm not judging nobody. But if you're convicted, thank the Holy Spirit. Some of you have desires that are self-motivated. They're vainglory. They're prideful. They're arrogant. It's about you. It's not about Jesus. Jesus said in Luke 9, if you have a desire to come after me, well, then here's what you need to do. Oftentimes, our human nature has many desires, and I can think of so many things that I want. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, not one time, daily, every day. 
And some would say, well, the word daily is not in the original language. Well, when you study it in the original language, the tense that are being used within the Greek language, the grammar clearly implies that the picking up of the cross is not something that's done once. It's something that's done on a regular basis. Because that's what we're to be doing. Do you live for Christ? Listen to this. Do you live for Christ at one time and one time alone? Yes or no? Do you live for Christ every single day? Yes or no? That's what the scriptures teach. You don't practice love and forgiveness the first day you get saved and that's it. You're like, I'm saved. I'm good, man. I, did, I already did it. I picked up my cross, man. I tried it. That doesn't work that way. It goes on to say here, and listen, guys, you know me, I, I like it raw sometimes. I, I, didn't, I didn't know if, I, if I'd let you guys know that it was going to be rated R tonight, and it is rated R. It's real, okay? For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and, and is himself destroyed or lost? Here, here's, here's the kicker for the desire. Are you ready for this? Because what is he telling you? He's saying that man's natural desires are for what? What is Jesus saying here? Don't look at me. I'm not Jesus. Look at the verse. Come on now. What does it say here? What does it say? What does it profit a man to gain what? What is Jesus saying the desire in man is to what? To be in the world. Our desires are worldly. That's the best you and I can produce. But if we practice Psalm 37, God puts the desires in our heart. We speak these desires out, and if we trust in the Lord, and we delight ourselves in the Lord, and we commit our ways to the Lord, the desires that God puts in our hearts, you better believe without a doubt, you're going to speak it out because he put it there, and he will bring it to pass. No doubt about it. That's not none of this positive confession, blab it and grab it, name it and claim it junk. I'm only hanging around positive people because positive things are going to happen. I have that authority. I claim that dominion. Get out of here with that. Speak those things that aren't as though they were. Only God can do that, the Bible says. You cannot do that. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words. I like this. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words. How can you know if someone is ashamed of Jesus and his words? Listen to their desires. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. And, and the same disciples that are there, you know, praying with Jesus and they're experiencing it, these are the same guys that are right here listening to Jesus, right? And, those, and the ones that didn't taste death till they seen his kingdom was Peter, James, and John. Did they not? They were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they saw Jesus transfigured. That's what Jesus was talking about. And they saw him transfigured. Jesus is saying, listen, if your desires are brought about by the Lord, if you're taking up your cross and following me, and, and if I am Lord and not just rabbi, because remember, rabbi was a big thing. Judas is not lying by the statement that he calls Jesus. Jesus was a rabbi. Remember, guys, Jesus ministered in the Galilee. You had many paid rabbis in the Galilee. His home base in Capernaum, right? And remember that all the Jews that lived in the Galilee were Galilean Jews. And when you hear the term, these unschooled Galileans, that was a derogatory term. It wasn't a true statement. The only reason why they call them unschooled is because they are not Judean Jews. Remember, there were two types of Jews, Judean Jews and Galilean, uh, Galilean Jews. And the Judean Jews had what? They had the temple. They had the synagogue. They had everything there. This is where the people came to worship. This is what they came to do. But the Jews in the Galilee, well, the temple wasn't in the Galilee. That's in the north. But this is where Jesus did all of his ministry. Now it makes sense when Jesus said, a 
physician doesn't need to come to those who need no physician. He comes for the sick. And the Jews in the Galilee didn't have the temple. And it doesn't mean that they were less. The Judean Jews said they were less. But did you know that the Jews in the Galilee were smarter than the Judean Jews? They had the Decapolis. Deca meaning ten, polis, cities, the Decapolis. These were Gentile cities in the Galilee. There was trade. They spoke more than one language. They spoke Greek. They spoke Hebrew. They were able to speak Aramaic. They, they spoke all these languages. And they were more schooled and learned in Greek culture than the, than the Judean Jews. And they understood the dynamic of Greek culture more. They were more educated. And then they had their schools of thought and training in that day. Beit Sefer which most of the young children went to Beit Zephyr, which was like their elementary school. Beit Medrash was like Bible college for them. And then they had Beit Talmid. But you could not go to Beit Talmid if you wanted to because a rabbi had to invite you. And this is why when Jesus told the disciples, follow me, the Bible says immediately they dropped their nets. Because if a rabbi never invited you to be a disciple... That's because they saw nothing good in you. Jesus went to these fishermen, maybe their whole entire lives, longing to hear the words from a rabbi, follow me. And they never heard it until Jesus came on the scene and said, follow me. And for the first time they heard those words, immediately dropped their nets and went after Jesus. These are the ones that Jesus is saying, if you desire to come after me. And they had the right desire. These are the ones that call him Lord. Judas never had this experience. He called him rabbi, which is a true statement. But can I ask you this question tonight? Is he Lord to you or is he rabbi to you? Today we serve a church where Jesus is just rabbi. What is the difference between Lord and rabbi? Need I remind you? Jot it down. Hashtag it. Your desires. And some say, oh, I got spiritual desires. Here's the problem. You talk, talk, talk and never do nothing with them. Those are not desires of the Lord. God doesn't just have these wishful thinking thoughts, you know. Hey, one day I will send my son to go to the cross. One of these days when I get around to it. No, he did it. The time is now. Jesus said his betrayers are at hand. It's all coming together. This is the will of God. Jesus is following the will of the Father. And you want to know what? The disciples are half asleep, man. Judas is on his way with the betrayers to arrest Jesus. Jesus is in agony in his prayer, sweating drops of blood and telling the disciples, can't you just stay awake for a little bit? Can you tarry with me for one hour? I need your help. I need you to pray with me. We need a battle in prayer together. This is a very intense moment in my life. I'm about to go to the cross to not only die for your sins, but the sins of the world, people that will reject me and hate me. And I am going to give my life for them. And notice the intensity and then he goes on to say, the time is now. Let's go and let's meet Judas. And while he was still speaking, Judas comes. Jesus views him as one of the twelve. G Judas views Jesus as a rabbi with a great multitude. Roman soldiers, John chapter 18 says in verse 3. Temple guards, according to Luke chapter 22 and verse 52, and they come with swords and clubs, and they come from the chief priests and the elders of the people, perhaps assuming that the Passover crowds would interfere. Because remember, in chapter 26 and verse 5, they were kind of thinking, how can we get Jesus? But they said, let's wait till after the feast, lest the crowd has an uproar, and now we're dealing with a bigger problem. Boy, they came ready to take him. They came ready to take him. And Jesus is over here saying, I'm going to let them take me. Some of you didn't get that. Let me say that again. I'm going to let them take me. Jesus completely in control. Completely in control. Now his betrayer had given them a sign. Isn't this interesting? Does that even mean anything to you? His betrayer gave them a sign. Does that sound like anything to you guys? 
Jesus said, pagans seek a sign. Oh, you guys don't even know what's going on here. My goodness, let's, let's get in this right now. Trust me, you got to see this. Listen, Judas is giving them a sign because the religious leaders always wanted a sign. They always wanted another sign. Show us, prove to us that you are who you say you are. Declare it by some magical work that you can do. And Jesus had already did great miracles among them. And Jesus goes on to say, no other sign will be given to you except that of the prophet Jonah. No other sign will be given to you. Judas gives them a sign, and Judas' sign would seize the moment. Jesus will give them a sign, on the other hand, and his sign will seize their lives if they allow it, because Jesus will be raised from the dead. Judas tried to give a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. They needed Judas to identify Jesus. The Bible says that when they came to Jesus in John chapter 18 in verse 6, they says, Jesus said, whom are you seeking? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And the Bible says they all fell back. Notice the power in Jesus' words. And you know what John 18 says? Jesus asked the question twice. And what did he emphasize? Leave the disciples alone. Because those whom the Father has given me, he says, I will not lose none of them. Jesus had to do it twice. He had to ask them twice to emphasize that the disciples were not to be taken captive, that he was the only one to be arrested, and they fell back. They fell backwards. The very power of Jesus' words. There was power in Jesus' words, yes, in John chapter 7, in verses 45 and 46. What did they ask? They said, how come you guys haven't arrested him already? What's your problem? And you know what they said? No man has ever spoken words like these. I love that man. And then Jesus says, I am he. I am. Book of Exodus chapter 3. I am that I am. I am Jesus declared to be God when they says we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. Judas is over there trying to kiss him, you know, and just and they're, they're going in there. And Jesus says, I am. He, everybody falls back. The disciples, Peter, James and John are half asleep and they're probably like, what's going on here? Judas, what are you doing? Why, why are these guys on the floor? I think this was a very intense moment. Jesus asks again, and he's saying, leave the disciples alone. Judas says, whomever I kiss, he's the one, sees him. And immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, once again, not Lord, but rabbi. Isn't this amazing to you guys? Well, true followers of Jesus, they call him Lord. False followers call him rabbi. In the words of J. Vernon McGee, if he's not the Lord of all, he's not the Lord at all. And Jesus said to him, to Judas, the one who's betraying him with a kiss, friend, why have you come? Jesus called him friend. Matthew records in verse 47, as the other writers do, that he was one of the twelve. Jesus calls him friend. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and they took him. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm thinking on this scene, with all jokes aside, when you're thinking on this scene, like these guys just fell down when they asked, when Jesus asked them, who are you looking for? Right? Judas has just betrayed Jesus. The disciples are probably perplexed and angered. This is the betrayer because Jesus didn't say it was him. Like, hey, Judas is the one that's going to come. They're probably figuring, where's Judas at? There's only 11 of us here. Now here's Judas with this great crowd. Roman soldiers mingled in with some of the chief's soldiers, and they're there to arrest Jesus, and then they're, they fall back, and then Judas kisses Jesus, and they seize him immediately. And verse 51 says, And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Now in John's gospel, chapter 18 and verse 10, John says, that was Peter. Peter 
When he saw Jesus being seized, when he saw Jesus being taken and arrested, Jesus said in verse 46, rise, let us be going, see my betrayer is at hand. He said he, he was going to be handed over into the hands of sinners. And Peter responds. Peter, listen, was either half asleep when Jesus was trying to explain this because he wasn't praying. I don't even know if you guys see what Jesus is saying here. This all goes back to what Jesus said. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Do you see now the flesh in full action right now? Yes, Peter's response is a response of the flesh. Jesus said, Peter, your flesh is weak. And Peter didn't even respond to it. He was like, huh? What? I'm not in the flesh. I'm asleep right now. And what Jesus was telling Peter is we need to pray because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Peter draws his sword. Quick to draw the sword but not to pray. Get that? The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Some of us are quick to draw the sword, but not quick to pray. The Bible says in Psalm 41 in verse 9, in Psalm 55 in verse 12, 49 or 41, 9 and 55, 12. Through David, the psalmist, Betrayed by his closest friend. These psalms give us a picture of Jesus' betrayal by his friend, Judas Iscariot. That's why Jesus called Judas friend, so the scriptures could be fulfilled. Betrayed by his friend. Peter pulls his sword out and he most likely was aiming for the head of this individual. God, is P Peter, Peter, boy, I tell you. Peter's like one of those guys, like, let's give him the fivefold ministry, you know, and hands on ministry, and we'll pray for him after. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 4, it says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Peter was fighting the wrong battle. Jesus warned him. The spirit indeed wills. The spirit wills to pray and battle in prayer. But your flesh, your flesh is going to rule you. It's going to overtake you and it's weak. And rather than pray like you're supposed to, you're going to draw a sword. And remember when I told you that Peter really meant it when he said, I'll die with you. This just goes to show that he really meant it. Listen, guys, look at this picture here. Pay attention to what's going on here. Trusting in his own hands, the best he could do is cut off an ear. The best you can do is just cut off an ear. And that's what some of you do with the sword of the Spirit, man. All you're doing is chopping ears off because you don't know how to use the Word of God. You're Bible thumping people, beating them down. Quoting scripture that it's not even scripture. How about the other one that we always say? Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Liar. You can't resist him. You cannot. Now that's not an excuse to say the devil made me do it. The Bible says submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The only way you can resist the devil is if you first submit to God. It's funny how we grab these little catchphrases and we expect God to support it and back it up. He's up there like, what, what are you talking about? That's not my word. That's your word. It's the work of your hands. And the best you can do is chop an ear off. But it's so amazing to see what God does with Peter. Peter had to deny Jesus. Peter had to weep bitterly. Peter had to go through what he needed to go through so Peter can learn that the work of his hands, the best it can produce, is chopping ears off. I don't want to chop ears off. God is saying, listen, Peter, you were a good fisherman. The problem is you're not skilled in using the knife, but let me show you how to use the knife. And when I empower you with the power that you need to do my work, now it's not going to be a work of the hands that just chops off the ear. It's going to be a work of the Holy Spirit, according to Acts chapter 2, where your words will cut men's hearts. 
And because you trust in the power of my hand, says the Lord. Oh, you'll cut, but you're not going to chop ears off. You're going to cut men's hearts. And the Bible says when Peter preached that profound message, they said they were cut to the heart. And they said, what must we do? Jesus said, or Peter said, repent all of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Oftentimes we try to battle with the work of our hand. This is amazing, guys. Everybody say, hmm, yeah. That's what I was doing when I was reading this, man. You know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about here in the garden how Jesus is fixing what Adam messed up. And remember in the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, in verse 24, the Garden of Eden. Remember, Eden means pleasure. It means delight, right? And that delight and that pleasure was corrupted by sin. And then the Bible says God drove man out of the Garden of Eden because of their sin. And he put a cherubim angel there, right? Remember that? And the Bible says that the angel had his sword drawn. In every direction. So in the garden, a sword was drawn in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus tells Peter, put your sword away. Because that which Jesus came to do was to complete what Adam failed to do. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he makes it very clear to the Corinthian believers in verse 45 that... The first Adam came and brought about death. The last Adam came to restore and make right what the first Adam failed to do. We see a restoration in the Garden of Gethsemane by Jesus' submission to the will of the Father. Adam failed to submit to the will of the Father. Jesus came to fix it. I love the contrast between the two gardens, don't you? It started in the garden, it's ending in the garden. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. This is not that kind of battle, Peter. If I allow you guys to fight by the sword and defend me, all of you will die by the sword. Because this is not a battle of flesh and blood. This is the will of the Father. It must take place. He says, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? There's six in a legion. Can you imagine 12 legion of angels? The number is upwards of about maybe 72,000. And why would Jesus say this? Because Luke's gospel in chapter 22 in verse 43 says that an angel came to minister to Jesus. He was very well aware that he could easily call upon a legion of angels and they can... Now, now remember that we read in 2 Kings chapter 19 that one angel killed 185,000. One angel killed 185,000 troops. Can you imagine? Wow. 72,000 what they can do. They could wipe out this multitude with clubs and, and, and whatever else they had. Lanterns, John's gospel says, and... They went over there with everything they had. They were just like Peter. And Jesus was in control of everything. You know what I love about this too? Is that when the ear is chopped off, Luke's gospel chapter 22 and verse 51 says that Jesus heals. Can you, can you imagine that? Nobody asked for it to be healed. Nobody asked for prayer. Like the dude probably has his hand on his ear, you know, screaming. I don't know, screaming. We don't know. But Jesus just like, hold on. I got to take care of something. Peter, I'm always having to clean up your mess. Grabs the ear, slaps it on the guy. Okay, now arrest me. It's crazy. Nobody asked for prayer. This was a miracle done without any faith. None whatsoever. Jesus done many miracles without faith. This is amazing. He just slaps the ear back on. This, guys, this should have never happened. This is not part of the story. Peter, you know, it's like, 
the, to me, this, it's so amazing to see how in control Jesus, I'm sorry, guys, <laughs> how in control Jesus was. Think about it. He was completely in control. And, and you can imagine, you know, those soldiers, they couldn't buckle in pressure, guys. So the dude's ears chopped off, and he's there like, you know, Jesus is like, hold on, this isn't right, you know? And Peter, all the while, is not caring about the guy's ear. Peter's mind is probably like, I missed. <laughs> Imagine if Peter would have struck where he was going. That would have been an amazing sight to see. Then we could have used the story of David and Goliath. One man's head's chopped off and delivered. The other man's head's chopped off and put back on. I mean, Jesus would have put whatever back on. I guarantee you he would have put it back on. Because Peter's work of the flesh went against the will of God. And because Jesus is completely in control. I love this. Because Jesus is completely in control, even when we deviate from the will of God, Jesus does the miraculous to bring us back into the will of God. That's an awesome promise, man. That is an awesome. Th th this story is so amazing. It's powerful. Jesus still has to go to the cross. This is an amazing drama unfolding here. You put your sword in his place. I can pray to the Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? You see what he's telling Peter here? You're getting in the way of the will of God. Anytime, listen guys, anytime you try to do it in the work of your own, you can spiritualize it, you can quote scripture, you can say, like people say, God spoke to me. I mean, how do you argue that? It's like they come to me, they're like, you know, God spoke to me, pastor. I'm just like, well, okay, whatever, you know. Let's hear what you're going to say. And some way out stuff that you know is not God. And then you tell them, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think that's the Lord. And then they're just like, you're just jealous of me. You're just, you know. <laughs> no, I heard from. Then you see them later and it was never the Lord. Imagine if Jesus would have took Peter and said, I need to sit you down for ministry. We need to talk. <laughs> Peter would have said, you know I hear from heaven. Remember, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, yeah, I heard from the Lord and I chopped the ear off. That was God. Could have easily said that. Jesus is saying what Peter did was wrong, period. Because it went against the will of the father. Jesus said here, how then could the scriptures be fulfilled? In other words, if I would have allowed you, Peter, to fight with the sword, the scriptures would not be fulfilled. If Jesus gives careful detail to the word of God being fulfilled as it pertains to his life, he's the greatest example for you and for me that we should give careful detail to the will of God being lived out by the scriptures in our lives. We don't dictate the will of God in our lives. He does. It's his will. It's not yours. It's never yours. Never will be. Your will's gone. It's crucified on the cross. Your will is his will. And in that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. You know, Matthew's gospel is the only one that records this speech. Did you know that? And why? Why do you think Jesus is saying this? The only thought and the best thought that comes to my mind, I think is so amazing. I believe that here the religious leaders were irrational in their arrest. Let me say that again. The religious leaders were irrational in their arrest. Why? Because religion, religiosity makes you irrational. And Jesus is saying here very clearly, you could have arrested me any time, I would have went. The difference between religion and relationship, Jesus is saying, this is what religion has to offer, this is what relationship has to give. 
But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. What scriptures? Remember what Jesus said in verse 31? I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. These are the same ones that vowed that they would never do that. And they did. Let's close tonight with these three things. Very simple. Jot these down. What are your desires? What are your desires? Is Jesus Lord or Rabbi? Is Jesus Lord or Rabbi? And what you're doing for the Lord today, is it a work of the flesh? Or is it a work of the Holy Spirit? What are your desires? Is he Lord? Is he Rabbi? Is it a work of the flesh or is it a work of the Spirit? How you answer that will determine who you're following.